this is Joseph Clare, and you're listening to George Fox Talks Theology. Hey, welcome to uh, George Fox Podcast. This is Joseph Clare. Uh, Executive Dean of the Cultural Enterprise and Professor of Theology here, and I'm here with a very special guest all the way from across the pond, Michael Ward uh, from Oxford. Welcome, Michael. It's so good to have you. Thank you, Joe. Good yeah. to be with you. <laughs> it's great to be with you. Uh, you're on attachment many places. One of them is your research fellowship at Blackfriars and and uh, you're in that that ancient city there. We're so glad to have you in. Um, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk is that I just picked up a copy of your book, After Humanity, a guide to Lewis's uh, book, The Abolition of Man, which I'm, I'm chewing on now. I'm just, it takes me about four weeks to make it through each footnote. So I'm, I'm probably by, <laughs> before I die, I will have made it through your book. But no, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing book. And it's one of Lewis's tougher books, I would say. It's underappreciated in some ways, but feels so relevant and I want to talk about why it's relevant for us um, as contemporary folks and in the university but before that I thought it would just be great out of my own curiosity and personal interest to hear what drew you to C.S. Lewis or what was your first encounter he's this person who seems perennially interesting to us and maybe more popular today than ever but what's what was your experience of being drawn to Lewis? I think I got into him the way that probably most people do, namely through the Narnia books, having them read to me by my parents when I was a little boy. Hmm. And uh, having had them read to me, I then read them to myself when I was old enough and enjoyed them. And so I got into Lewis's other fiction. I, I remember moving into Screwtape Letters and The Great Divorce and then into his Christian apologetics, Mere Christianity, The Problem of Pain read all through those in my teenage years. And then I came here to Oxford to do my English degree. And so I began studying him a little bit from a more sort of professional point of view, um, his, his academic expertise in English literature, and uh, did a short undergraduate thesis on him. And then uh, when it came time for me to do my PhD, uh, Lewis was the obvious choice because I was really fairly expert in his works. And um, so without any very conscious, deliberate uh, decision, He's accompanied me my whole life and indeed has formed the focus of my own scholarship. That's, that's amazing. And yeah, I mean, the Narnian uh, in you sort of from childhood until now has been a, a dominant theme. I mean, Planet Narnia, a very scholarly university press book about medieval cosmology and um, these children's stories sort of catapulted you into, at least for my limited kind of theological world, fame. I mean, you're famous. <laughs> you, made, you got BBC documentaries. What, what would you say, um, how did you stumble upon, I mean, it's like you were cracking a code. I mean, that's sort of how it's been teed up. And how did you stumble upon that? And, and what does it, what does it mean to you? Yeah, the, uh, the theological imagination that I was studying for my PhD researches um, was not focused on the Narnia Chronicles when I set out, but when I was halfway through my doctorate, I, I stumbled up upon this imaginative blueprint, as I call it, to the Narnia Chronicles. Um, so everything became Narnia focused. Um, <laughs> And the and the blueprint is the seven heavens, the the seven spiritual symbols of the planets as as they were understood in the medieval cosmos, um, and each Narnia chronicle is written so that it embodies and expresses the the characteristics of one of those seven heavens, mm -hmm. and um, when you come at the Narnia chronicles from that point of view, all sorts of otherwise puzzling little apparent inconsistencies and obscurities suddenly click into focus and make beautiful sense. Mm. So I think I think that's probably why it, it caught the imagination because uh, uh, lots of people had tried to sort of crack the Narnia code. All sorts of different theories had been suggested about what Lewis was really working to, the seven deadly sins, the seven sacraments, any seven that people could think of really had been suggested. But the one seven which is all over his work, namely the seven planets, 
have been uh, mysteriously overlooked. So um, that was the the essence of Planet Narnia, the book you mentioned, and yeah, it became the subject of a BBC documentary, The Narnia Code. <laughs> It's taken me all around the world, invitations coming left, right and centre. It's because um, everybody's interested in Narnia. Um, and now that it has this additional level of scholarly undergirding, um, there are all, all the more reasons to be interested in it. It's great. I mean, one of the one of the things about Lewis that has been so helpful for my own faith is is the way that he brings Christian faith um he's obviously deeply rational um and thoughtful but he also sees the role of the imagination and the importance of narrative and story and symbol and image and obviously for christians who are steeped in the world of the bible theology is a work of making sense of these stories in some ways and these symbols and a lot of us i think have appreciated lewis's apologetic in this age because of the role of the imagination his ability to to like speak to a different part of the soul or the heart through a moving image or through a symbol. But the abolition of man, I take to be like the extreme, like highly developed opposite part of Lewis, like fully on display or at work where it's a rational, almost moral philosopher. It's compelling. It's beautiful. It's rhetorically um, savvy, but it also is like, you have to like pound your way through this book. So how, how do you think about that tension between um, reason and imagination at the level of like the expression in, in his work that he was up to? And how does the abolition of man fit into that sort of work? Well, that is a huge question. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and one which I think um, I, would, I would take in a slightly different way, because I, I, I myself would not distinguish reason from imagination as if they were somehow alternative modes of discourse, uh, almost opposed ways of uh, tackling a topic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's how Lewis understood the relationship between reason and imagination. I think he thought that reason could only operate if it was imaginative, mm. and that imagination should not operate unless it were rational. Um, so it's not like reason and imagination are related like this. It's like they're related like this. Reason rests upon imagination. Can't do anything without imagination. Mm. And imagination ought not to do anything without being submitted to the higher court of rational inquiry. So the only question is, is not the question is not whether you're going to be rational or imaginative, but whether you're going to be um, abstract or concrete, whether you're going to be um, argumentative and propositional, mm. or whether you're going to be narrative and dramatic. Mm. And so, yeah, Narnia, of course, he's narrative, he's dramatic, he's concrete. Uh, there's a lot of um, event, there's story, there's character. Mm. In The Abolition of Man, um, he's developing a thesis. Um, he's tackling ideas. But they're all imaginatively realized. They have to be. Because um, imagination is the organ of meaning, in, in according to Lewis's definition. And one of the good things about The Abolition of Man is, although it is a very philosophical work, very abstract uh, in one sense, very um, ideational, um, it's, it's nonetheless, as you mentioned, a great work of rhetoric. Because this highly abstract argument is, is couched in very accessible, memorable, sensible terms. And this is one of the things I tried to bring out in my conclusion of, of After Humanity. I, I talk about the abolition of man as a poetic work. Mm. Even though it's philosophical, it's also poetic. Mm. And I think this is the great strength of Lewis as a writer, that even when he's at his most abstract and philosophical, he's, he's always drawing upon appropriate symbols, metaphors, analogies, um, and that's what, well, that's one of the reasons that The Abolition of Man has become such a classic. It's a great work of rhetoric. Yes. No, that's, um, you mentioned in your intro, or part of the intro, that Lewis is dealing with really, really deep philosophical terrain. So philosophical anthropology. What's a human being? What's a human being for? Subjectivism as a philosophical school and emotivism and ethics. None of those words 
make it into the book, right? There's no isms. There's not even the big word. It's what is he, he's talking about man as man. I mean, that seems to be sort of exemplifying that, um, that simplicity of rhetorical device that it makes it accessible in some ways on the surface. Cause you can sort of leaf through and be like, yeah, I think I understand every word as a discrete mm-hmm. thing, but then understanding the bigger project that's going on, that's hard. And I think that's where your overview and commentary really is so helpful. So how would you provide um, our listeners with a thumbnail for those who haven't um, dove into abolition before, or maybe thinking about it or tried and, and got thwarted, but what's, what's your sense of the synopsis of the, the thesis he's advancing? The synopsis of the thesis is uh, twofold. It's, it's both a, a defense and a prophecy. It's a, the abolition of man is a defense of the objectivity of value. Lewis is arguing that value is a, an objective reality out there in the world that we need to recognize if we are to be fully human, hmm. uh, because we are in relation with it. Um, so it's a defense of the objectivity of value, but it's also a prophecy of what will happen if we don't recognize the objectivity of value. He's forecasting where we will go if we continue in the in the modernist strain of subjectivism, mm-hmm. which he saw as as taking over the, the academy and, and the culture at large, uh, even in the first half of the 20th century. And if it was true then, it's even more true now. Um, so it's a it's a great work of predictive philosophizing, mm-hmm. um, and and very negative in that respect. He's he's painting a pretty bleak picture, and that's why the book is called the abolition of man. He's saying mm-hmm. this is going to lead to our annihilation as a distinctively human species. Mm-hmm. Um, we will either, as it were, descend into mere animality, become indistinguishable from the beasts, or will evaporate up into false spirituality becoming like the angels disembodied rational spirits but quite possibly not like the angels rather like the demons uh, the fallen angels um but what constitutes humanity what is the specifically anthropological element to our identity is is the chest which unites the the rational man with the visceral man um and so that's why the opening chapter of the abolition of man is called men without chests hmm. that we we've neglected this liaison officer which unites our appetites and our senses with our uh with our spirit our rationality our logic our capacity for abstraction all of those things which are located as it were in the head hmm. um and it's interesting you, you talk about narnia um one of the one of the nice little footnotes that I I hope you <laughs> have chewed your way through um, or will chew your way through is that um, you find interesting little references to the chest even in Narnia. Mm. So Peter Pevensey, you know the the leader of the children in the first book, he grows up to be a, a tall and deep chested man, mm. whereas Shift the ape, the 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 villainous antichrist like ape in the last battle uh, we're told that well he says at one point that apes always have weak chests hmm. so even in narnia you've got this sort of uh symbolic emphasis upon the importance of developing your chest in order to be properly human and if you're not then you're you're becoming not not, not much different from a trousered ape uh, to use a phrase from the abolition of man yes the trousered the trousered ape it he says in that chapter, the the opening chapter, Men Without Chest, it's by this middle element, the chest that man is man, for by his intellect, he is mere spirit and by his appetite, mere animal. And I wonder, I mean, he doesn't get into the like long-winded historical genealogy in this, you know, pithy book, but I wonder from his other works or from your own research, like what would Lewis's genealogy be of how we ended up in this predicament uh, kind of intellectual genealogy um well that's not something i i particularly go into in the abolition of, in in after humanity um i try to give a bit of background but not 
you know, not generations back, not centuries back. Yeah. Um, that's a bit beyond, well, first of all, beyond my capacity and also possibly beyond the patience of my readers. Um, cause I, I'm not, I'm not going to give a, <laughs> an overview of the, of the, of the last several, uh, centuries of, of Western philosophy, how, how we got to this position. Um, Suffice it to say, there there is, I hope, a very helpful quotation from Alistair McIntyre on that point, mm-hmm. um, where he talks about um, uh, Kierkegaard and two other philosophers and how they sought to relate the reason and the passions. Mm-hmm. I, I can't now remember the, the precise philosophers that he refers to. Um, but anyway... He, in a pithy thumbnail sketch, um, says you, you, there have been various ways in which reasons and passions have been sought to be related to each other. Emphasize the ra- rationality, emphasize the passionate, or go beyond them both, as Kierkegaard does, um, into a you know criterionless choice. Um, and the interesting thing that Lewis does is that he he's he's just trying to he's not emphasizing rationality over animality nor passions over reason he's saying we need both um and indeed this is the great thing about the abolition of man that he's he's saying sentiments feelings matter um we should be emotionally intelligent and we should be intelligently emotional we, we shouldn't try to squelch our appetites and we shouldn't valorize our rationality unduly because we are rational animals, to use that classic definition of the of, of humanity, um, and holding those two things in tension um, is, I think, the great balancing act of the abolition of man, and one which, well, he was he was ideally trained to do, um, partly because of his own formation uh, as a philosopher at Oxford, and indeed before that with the ultra logical rationalist uh, William Kirkpatrick. But also because he had this poetic side to him. He, he'd always wanted to be a poet more than a philosopher. And indeed, the first two books that Lewis ever published were works of poetry. So this is the unusual thing about Lewis. He, he, he himself was both exceptionally rationally gifted and also deeply in tune, as a poet needs to be, with his passions and his senses. Mm. Oh, that's... that's uh, that comes through in all of his work. I think... This, this notion of the trousered ape um, has always struck me in this book because he, he described, he uses that phrase to describe like the situation you're in as a student of contemporary Western thought. And this is in the 1940s, but now it still feels relevant. And that is, on the one hand, the really hard truths that you're getting in school or university from science, you know, using logic and reason and empirical observation and experiment, that's fundamentally telling you a story about our animality and our inheritance uh, genetically and evolutionarily with other animals. And, you know, in a post-Darwinian world, there's the ape thing, right? It's like right there on the surface. Um, And yet our morality, our manners, um, are these like long standing traditions that include, you know, the virtue of kindness and compassion and values of human worth and dignity. And Lewis, I think that that's part of the book that feels so prophetic in some ways is to see how incoherent of a landscape this is to train another generation of human beings in which they mm. have one picture of themselves, which feels like the real picture. It's the hard objective scientific truth. And then this other picture, which is this flowery, fading, apparently subjective and totally relative landscape, but it's the stuff that makes our lives worth living and holds us together as society. How would you, um, I feel like that trouser day um, insight is is so relevant. Do you feel like that's still the predicament we're in? And, and what can you say about it? Yeah, I think... Um... The situation hasn't changed very much really since Lewis's day. Um, But one of the reasons why the abolition of man has become such a classic is because Lewis himself, in his own development as a man, as a person, as a thinker, had I think grappled with that very 
polarization, their very opposition. He, indeed, he, he says as much in Surprised by Joy. He, um, and Malcolm Geit, the, uh, the British mm. literary critic, I quote him, page 35, Lewis's attack has a personal force behind it. He's speaking from experience. Lewis mm. himself had felt deeply the consequence of the reductivism he's now attacking, had known what it is to live in a world in which facts without one trace of value and feelings without one trace of truth or falsehood confront one another. And Lewis himself talks about how the two hemispheres of his life were in the, the two hemispheres of his brain were in sharpest opposition. On the one hand, he believed in a world of atoms and evolution and military service. And on the other hand, he believed in the garden of the Hesperides and um, a romantic longing. Hmm. How to combine the two, as you were just saying, they stand up over against each other, hmm. seemingly eternally divorced, you know, and none shall cross from here, from there, none from there to here, you know, like the the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, but Lewis himself had overcome that divorce in his own development. And I think that's one of the reasons, again, why the abolition of man has achieved such status, because it's springing from a deep part of Lewis's own autobiography. Yes, no, that's... So if, if the trouser day... Um... That in the trousers being some kind of custom or manners on top of a pure animality. So that's an emblem of this division of head um, and body or appetites. That divorce between facts and values, between feelings and any reality of truth or falsehood. He thinks that's not good. That's not right. There's a proposal in the book as well, right? There's a different way in which we can think of the moral life as not just being totally hostage to women preference and subjectivity. What is his, his proposal? What's the alternative? Um, to stabilize our sentiments, not to let them run amok, nor to squelch them, but to regularize them, to civilize them, mm. to stabilize them in a well-developed chest so that they can become dependable sentiments. They can become just sentiments. In other words, they can become ordered to the reality of the facticity which confronts us. Um, because emotions are not necessarily illogical. Um, and indeed, this is his whole the thr thrust of his argument, that feelings can be in, in accord with reality and mm -hmm. making them accord with reality mm -hmm. is part of what it means to become a mature human being. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, this is part of what it means to, to train and to educate the younger generation, to teach them, as Aristotle said, what it is that they should like and what it is that they should dislike. Um, that's part of what education consists in, moral education at any rate. Um, so again, it comes back to this point about we should be both em emotional and intelligent, yes, but that, that leaves the two things, if you're not careful, rather like mm. oil and water, mm -hmm. immiscible. It, it's better to say we should be emotionally intelligent and we should be intelligently emotional. And that... Right. That makes the, the membrane a bit more permeable between the head and the belly. Indeed, that, that's the whole point of the chest. He moves from there um, to that framework to a, a chapter called The Way, or the, the Tao is underneath of it, right? So this Eastern Chinese philosophical concept, and you nicely point out, it looks like Tao, but it's pronounced Tao. Um, and... The Tao ends up being this like huge, like human moral inheritance of ways to go about that formation, ways to think about that, that integration, that stabilization of sentiment, that passing on of things to like and, and dislike. And it kind of strikes the reader, uh, it, it struck me first reading it as a surprise about how wide ranging um, this this moral inheritance of us as human beings is it's not just the kind of classical Christian inheritance you know through the West it's as you say 
in your book that Lewis actually chose the Tao, this way, this tradition of thinking about the formation of virtuous, good human beings, this integrated approach to de-emphasize Western categories. So he chose the word the Tao and he chose examples and and uh, quotes and ideas from across the, the kind of universe of of human literature as a way to remind his readers that moral reality is universal. Was that surprising to you that that Lewis went the way he did with the Tao? Uh, well, yes, the first time I read The Abolition of Man, I remember being a bit surprised by it. Um, but as I tried to explain in the abolition of in my book after humanity, um, although although it's a very canny rhetorical move to to reach all the way over to Confucian philosophy and find this term uh, and use it as his as his governing descriptor rather than a, a much more obvious and to be expected term like natural law, um, although he he does sort of wrong foot the reader mm. in that respect. From another point of view, it's entirely harmonious and consistent with his Christian commitments because, of course, the way is an old term, almost the oldest term for Christianity. Uh, you know, the, the followers of the way in the book of Acts are the earliest Christians. And Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. So Lewis is very cleverly um, killing two birds with one stone by, by using this term Tao. Um, it's, it's one of the brilliant strategies or tactics that he uses um, to, uh, to widen his audience mm -hmm. while hopefully not lo losing his, his Christian followers. Because, uh, of course, by the 1943, when he first published his book, he had already achieved quite a profile as a public Christian intellectual and apologist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's precisely why he um, he didn't want to choose obvious Christian terminology in defending this this case, because the whole point of it is that it's it's not a specifically Christian argument, not even a specifically theistic argument that he's making. It's it's an anthropological argument. This is what it means to be human. Mm. And we can see this by looking all around at different traditions, different religions, different civilizations and cultures, all of whom he, or many of whom he cites in an appendix to the work. Um, they're all basically uh, assessing moral reality in the same way. They come to remarkably similar conclusions about the duty to ancestors, duty to posterity, the, the duty of special beneficence, the duty of general beneficence, the duty of veracity and justice, and so on. He, he has eight whole categories of, of these moral laws or duties um, with citations from Native American, Hindu, ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, Norse, Jude, Jewish, Christian. They're all there, and he doesn't privilege the, the Bible or Christian or Jewish terms at all. If anything, he deliberately underplays them. Um, because he knows that's going to be expected, and he's and he's as I say trying to wrong foot the the reader who's just going to say, oh, here we go again, Thomas Aquinas, I know all this. Um, no, 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 it's it's much more broadly based than that. Doesn't it seem incompatible though and contradictory to some of his other famous arguments? Of, like take the moral argument for the existence of God. So the claim that there's like. There are objective moral values in the world, and to shore those up, you need a metaphysical conception of the divine or God. I think of, I mean, one of my favorite chapters of Lewis is the first chapter of um, uh, Mere Christianity, where it's like right and wrong as clues to the meaning of the universe, where basically he's driving at, if you do not have some grounding arc conception of the good of God to ground all these other moral judgments, then morality is hostage to relativism in some ways that's how i read it but doesn't this you don't need god you have the objective reality of morality in this book but you maybe don't need god is this contradictory he's setting his sights very low in the abolition of man he's hmm. just as i say he's he's developing an anthropological case it's pure philosophy it's not theology let alone christian theology mm -hmm. um 
But Lewis was a great believer in uh, natural theology and in doing whatever you could under your own steam, as it were, without recourse to revelation, um, that is to say, you know, special revelation in mm -hmm. the Bible or in the person of Jesus Christ or through the authority of the church or, or whatever. No, there's this thing called general revelation, which is available to all human beings because we have been made in the image of God. Yeah. You don't need to believe that we've been made in the image of God to be a bearer of that image. Um, but of course, most people have believed in God or the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, modern atheism or agnosticism is a very recent development. Uh, we, we are naturally religious um, as a species. Um, but you don't need to be, be a specifically Christian religious person in order to ground the objectivity of value. You just need to be human. Mm. Um, so, yeah, in mere Christianity, he will advance from this moral argument to the reality behind the moral law, the lawgiver, God, and then the law keeper, the law transcender, Jesus Christ. He'll, he'll take those next two steps in mere Christianity. But in the abolition of man, he's content just to take the first step yeah. and to defend it very, in, in great detail, much more detail, of course, than he does in mere Christianity. Yeah. And that's fine. That's, that's a worthwhile project as far as he's concerned. Um, because what he's trying to do in a way is, as I, and I argue this in, in chapter uh, six, or, no, chapter four of my book, um, where I ask, is the abolition of man a, a religious work? In a way, Lewis is trying to get us back to healthy paganism, pious paganism, um, because that situation of, of, a, of a good, honest, God-fearing pagan who believes in right and wrong uh, as objective realities, that situation of paganism is, um, is much healthier philosophically than that of post-Christian subjectivism. Mm. Um, so if we have to become pagans first before we can become Christians, so be it. The terrible state we're in is is um, of of our post-Christian West mm. Mm. is far worse than classical pagans were ever in. Yeah, I mean part of I part of the way I was trained in theology, um, you know, in kind of a Protestant mood after. Karl Barth in the early part of the 20th century, kind of happening, you know, simultaneously with Lewis. And then Barth's Inheritors, one of my teachers um, at Duke and S Stanley Hauerwas was like this deep recovery of the particularity of Christian uh, speech around the moral life. So it was a, it was a movement away from natural law or universal enlightenment sounding approaches to ethics and a recovery of like the distinctive particularity of Christian speech, which comes out of the scriptures and the life of the church through time. And I found that to be really helpful renewal and recovery and appreciation of the tradition itself. But I wonder if there weren't unintended consequences or dangers to that recovery of the particularity of Christian speech and revelation for the moral life insofar as we've lost common ground um, as human beings. And I feel like we feel that maybe more intently now than even 80 years ago. But do you think Lewis, um, so he's, he's so smart, he's aware of what's going on in Christian theology, although he's not a professional theologian, do you find, do you think Lewis was responding to that kind of particularism, A, and B, do you think Lewis is like very helpful today to help us recover like a common moral language and landscape with other human beings in a pluralistic context? I don't think he was uh, specifically responding to that, no. I mean, he, he doesn't seem to have read Karl Barth, um, and whenever he refers to Barth, he, he does so well in a in a way which is <laughs> rather ignorantly hostile um he, he's sort of he's heard about bart more than read bart mm -hmm. and what he's heard he obviously doesn't like um so I, I don't think it was a response to that trend no i think it was more just a, a very natural outworking of his own anglicanism and his own classical education um i mean you're quite right and i think lewis would not disagree with you that the particularities of Christian speech are 
indeed particular and particularly valuable. Um, I mean, Lewis was a Christian <laughs> and he was a theist. He wasn't just a philosopher. Right. Um, but you must not make the, the good the enemy of the best or the best the enemy of the good. And yeah, theism and Christianity are better than the philosophical argument he's mounting in the abolition of man. That's no reason not to mount the argument he's mounting in the abolition of man. Mm. Um, he, let me quote uh, again a rather chewy footnote on page 21 where <laughs> Lewis, um, he, he says in one place that morality apart from religion cannot explain its own claims clearly, try any philosophical system of ethics. And in um, his book, The Pilgrim's Regress, he says as soon as John, that is his sort of allegorized self, the, his own moral self, as soon as the moral self attempts seriously to live by philosophy, it turns into religion. Mm. So he he knows where it's all leading and, and he wants to take people there uh, when that is the, the journey they've signed up for, as they have in mere Christianity. But not all journeys need to go from A to Z. Just getting from A to B is a worthwhile right. step to take. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I... I think that's right in there, that recovery of natural theology and, um, you know, shared common language around universal morality seems more precious today in a fractured time than, than ever before. So mm. I think one thing about this book that feels relevant for the students um, that I've taught it with, you know, I have the privilege of teaching in the university we have a great books program and we get to read it in the 20th century seminar and there seems to be a diagnosis um very practical diagnosis here of the the students experience of being um yeah trousered apes that probably sounds like a diss to them but this idea that on the one hand the cultural water they swim in is telling them that their moral and spiritual lives are entirely up to them it's not something that is handed down to them. It's not an objective thing out there to be discovered or known. It's something that is entirely up to them. It's self-creative. And that, I mean, that's, it's as simple as I just saw um, one of my students walking through town with a t-shirt that read, you do you, three words, you do you. And that sort of like, <laughs> I think captures the philosophy of the age, the kind of practical expression of subjectivism, emotivism, all these big ideas. On the other hand, we have, I think, the shadow of this inheritance as well, um, which is a strong understanding of the soul and the inner depths of the human being. So Charles Taylor wrote, writes this great long book, The Sources of the Self, in which he tries to kind of genealogical map. How did we come up with the notion of the self? Well, it's got inheritance of Platonic soul, Augustinian, you know, sort of uh, soul before God, all these things. But that sense of the inner depth, the shadow of the soul of the self, that feeling is a feeling that is not saying um, that my students, I think, and maybe me too, are not experiencing as, oh, this is just totally up to you. It's totally random to be manipulated and created. It's, it's, it's a true self. There's a true you in there. And if you don't get your external reality to line up with what is truly in there, then you're going to be unhappy or worse than being unhappy or inauthentic to the true self. And so we're kind of culturally, we're told it's totally relative and up to you. And yet internally, you're still tormented by the sense of being a true you. I wonder how, how does Lewis help us out of that? What I think is a very unhappy anxiety producing predicament for young people to be formed in. Yeah, it is a very anxiety producing predicament. Um, and it springs from this false opposition between um, th this idea of, of the um, crushing absolutism of objective reality, and this um, invertebrate centerlessness of personal uh, I, I, identity, I, identitarianism, um, on the other hand. Mm. And again, that's a false opposition. That, that's just a polarity which we needn't uh, go along with. Um, and I think this, again, is one of the, the balancing acts that Lewis 
brings off in the abolition of man that he he's not say, although he's a he's arguing as i've said for the objectivity of value he's he's not saying therefore we all become I- identical that we we just turn into cookie cuttered human beings mm. um we still have value as individuals we may have to reckon with and grapple with an objective reality but it is we subjects who who do that grappling Mm. and we have value as subjects Mm. we shouldn't fall into subjectivism but Mm. we cannot escape subjectivity and indeed one of the reasons we have been made as individuals is because we each have a unique subjectivity Mm. We, we each play a unique instrument in the in the divine orchestra um and Lewis is very good on this in in works like The Four Loves, for instance, where, where he's talking about friendship and how each friend brings out a different aspect of every other friend mm. and that only he can bring out. So when Charles dies, I lose not only Charles, but I lose that part of Ronald, which Charles could bring out. And he's there talking about Charles Williams and Ronald Tolkien, you know, the Inklings. Um, we need each other in order to be ourselves. Um and we need others in order to be, well, I think I was just saying that the same way around, but you, you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, so, um, I think, yeah, this is, this is the, this is the balancing act that Lewis strikes in the abolition of man. Mm. It's not, and, it, and indeed I point out how in that hideous strength, which is the kind of fictional counterpart to the abolition of man, the villains of that hideous strength are constantly emphasizing the need to acquire total objectivity, sheer objectivity, complete mm. objectivity. They have this thing called the objective room, which is a kind of torture chamber um, for achieving their objectivist ends. And it's not that kind of objectivity that Lewis is wanting to recommend at all. Mm. Um, that's wor- That's just as bad as complete subjectivism. There are, there are two ways of falling foul of this subject-object split. One is to disappear into the object, and the other is to retreat into the subject. They need to be held in t- dynamic tension. Mm-hmm. There's commerce. There are exchanges between ourselves as individual subjects and the out, outer world of objective reality. And and it's that d- dynamism that I think he, he manages very skillfully and subtly to express in The Abolition of Man. Uh, the more I've pressed into the abolition of man, the more I've realised its um, its its skill in in holding both ends of this line, um, so that the line doesn't go slack. But neither do you end up either at one pole or the other. It's mm-hmm. it's vibrant all the way along. Yeah. By the way, can I? I've mentioned earlier that quotation from Alistair McIntyre. I've now found it in the book. Uh, and of course, it's, it's Hume and Kant, as well as Kierkegaard, that he's talking mm. about. Let me just quote that paragraph, because it, it sort of speaks to this opposition yep. uh, and the genealogy that you were talking about. Just as Hume seeks to found morality on the passions, because his arguments have excluded the possibility of founding it on reason, so Kant founds it on reason, because his arguments have excluded the possibility of founding it on the passions, and Kierkegaard founds it on criterionless fundamental choice because of what he takes to be the compelling nature of the considerations which exclude both reason and passions. You know, there you've got an error to the right, an error to the left, an error in the middle. <laughs> and Lewis comes, he gets his arms around all three, as it were, and says, you're all wrong. Um, and... Not only does he do that very brilliantly in The Abolition of Man, but then Alistair MacIntyre in After Virtue does it even more solidly and sophisticatedly. Sure. Right. Matt, I mean, the After Virtue seems like they're not making the precisely same argument. There's a lot of consonants and MacIntyre's going to the, the level of detail and engagement with professional moral philosophy in a way that Lewis doesn't need to, doesn't want to, doesn't, you know, that's the, you, you make that all so clear. I mean, one of the great gifts of after humanity is that you're, you're bridging Lewis's work into the scholarly discourse uh, of his own time, of our time and, and presenting just because Lewis himself 
didn't write in a way that was entirely bogged down by the apparatus of scholarly footnotes. It's not that he wasn't aware of his interlocutors or other discourse. And he was paying his respects as you, as you show without having to, you know, <laughs> destroy the beauty and the elegance, you know, the simplicity of the rhetorical performance. I think more academics should try that <laughs> yeah. because there's, it, it reaches a broader audience. I wonder, you, you say in, um, I think on page 16, you're talking about how the difference between the moral life in the way and the contemporary um, sort of approach to the moral life as trousered apes, you, you say that the problem is that we no longer find the solution to the problems of life in knowledge and self-discipline and virtue, but increasingly in willpower technological control and surgical alteration of nature to suit our own convenience. Could you spell out more what the difference is between those two ways of life, those two ways to find meaning in the universe? They, they can be summarized, I suppose, with the terms um, organic and, and surgical. Uh, and Lewis is obviously favoring the organic working holistically, working personally, working from within the givenness of our own nature and of the, the nature of the world more generally considered. Because, the, because it, it's a, a moral ecology which, which we participate in and which, which is there in the universe at large. It's not just in the human psyche. Um, so that organic, and, and, and here we would, you know, he, he would be finding all sorts of friends with uh, the organic movement in, in the strictly ecological movement, um, you know, against fracking, against pesticides, against all these um, manipulations of, of genetic crops and all the rest of it. No, let nature take its course. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, nature is healthy. If only let it be nature. Of course, with with human stewardship understood as as, as a necessary component of of nature, mm. and on the other hand, you have the surgical, which stands over against nature, mm. attempting to chop it up and make it suit our purposes, um, whatever those purposes may happen to be, from one day to the next, um, and that's disastrous because. We are part of nature, and we have, we ourselves have a, a given nature which needs to be discovered, not just invented or controlled. Mm. And so, wisdom, mm -hmm. you know, what does philosophy mean? But the love of wisdom, a true philosophy, is going to be wisely in tune with our pre-existing nature and discovering mm. that, and and yeah, working with it and training it in appropriate ways of course that's part of what moral education consists in moral formation consists in um he, he's not he's not adopting some sort of anarchic naturalism in that sense mm. um but it has to be integral it has to be integrated with, with the with, with what we find um moral nature is discovered it's not just dreamt up from our own choices and preferences Mm. There's, oh, it's beautiful. There is this line um, in The Abolition Man where he's talking about education. And, you know, the book ostensibly is about education. As you point out, it's education with special reference, teaching English and, you know, forms upper school. It's, it's got this launching point about an English grammar book. Um, and then it's, it turns into this much bigger meditation on being human, but I do think there's a lot of relevance for the work of education, moral education. And there's a there's a line about education where he says, what is it but, you know, older birds teaching younger birds to fly? And I think that that seems to capture the way in which moral formation, moral education is really an apprenticeship um, of in the art of doing human being well? What does it look like to be a good human being? What is the art of doing human well? And it has a lot to do with apprenticeship, imitation, um, relationship, friendship, as you were just noting. And increasingly in education, because of 
the you know the the speed toward efficiency and the cost of things the scale of it the digitization of learning we feel i think the tension of can we keep that work of education which is very relational very very formative alive what do you what do you think lewis's diagnosis of contemporary higher education would be obviously that's a massive question and there's a zillion different <laughs> forms of higher education going on but where would Lewis think it's going well and not so well, do you think? Yeah, I think he would just despair at the, at the trends which have only increased in the decades since his death. It's interesting, even when he was, <clears throat> you know, a fairly middle-aged academic, before he reached the end of his life, he, he wrote to his godson, uh, Lawrence Harwood, who had just been ejected from Oxford um, mm. for failing his his um, what we call moderations. He, he'd failed his first year exams and so he had to leave Oxford. And Lewis wrote him this marvellous letter, a consoling, wise letter, very much in the tradition of old birds teaching young birds how to fly, saying, you, you probably feel that your, your life is in ruins at this moment. You've just been ejected from Oxford. But um, the, this idea that everything that's of value can be examined and measured is a fairly new one. Um, <laughs> you know, Oxford University for a long time did not have written exams. Um, you might have to defend your ideas in, in some sort of viva, some viva voce, some live voice exam. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd obviously have to show that you were, you know, reasonably intelligent to maintain your place in the university. But you wouldn't have to tick all sorts of boxes and, and satisfy the examiners in all sorts of hoop jumping exercises uh, just to prove that you were a, a validly intelligent person. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting, Lewis and indeed Tolkien and that, that whole generation of scholars, they didn't have doctorates. He was never Dr. Lewis. At least he didn't earn doctorates. He, he, gave, he was given several doctorates, but you didn't do PhDs in those days, and and Lewis rather looked down on those who did them. Um, there used to be this degree at Oxford called the B Lit, a Bachelor of Letters, and he once said there are three kinds of literacy: there's the literate, there's the illiterate, and then there's the B literate. Um, those who got the B Lit, they they go into some sort of strange third space, which is neither literate nor illiterate. illiterate. <laughs> Um, because it's jargon. It's You're learning more and more about less and less at just that point in your life, your mid-twenties, when you should be expanding and, and getting a universal education. That's why it's a university that you're part of. Uh, and you become you become a research beetle instead, um, his disparaging term for those who went into postgraduate research. Um, and yeah, as I say, that, that whole trajectory has just got worse and steeper since his death. And I think he would just, he would roll his eyes. He'd be rolling in his grave if he knew what was going on in and in, in not just in university life, but in in high schools too. And and well, all the way down to the earliest ages. Now children are getting measured from you know the cradle onwards. It's preposterous. You wonder. I never thought about this, but you wonder if the abolition of man. Um, doesn't represent the kind of work in the humanities, the book is about humanity and our common human inheritance that we need to renew and recover the heart of liberal education uh, in the West Ooh. and around the world. And that is what you just said about Lewis and his kind of critical, you know, scants toward those who are, um, who are going down just the endless rabbit trail of scholarly research. Again, there's Scientia, it's good, there's knowledge, but there's a limit, right? And as of course, it's how it goes back to the project of being human and living well, which he always seemed to keep in view. I mean, you and I first bumped into each other in Cambridge in graduate school doing, you know, these deep dives into the into the research, into the footnotes. And and yet since then, I think we both have kind of taken less traditional paths now into the intellectual life and into higher education. And we're living in a time of great, I think, upheaval and turmoil around higher education, not only because of costs and digitization and all those things, but also because, um, because of our 
need to reinvent that uh, the model in which old birds can teach young birds to fly. I mean, that Lewis himself was living kind of at the end of a tradition. You could say really the 20s and 30s and 40s is the, the moment at which, especially in the humanities, the turn toward a more scientific, social scientific approach to the scholarly material, the conferences, the papers, the articles, the books. There was just a shift in a research driven approach that certainly has changed the way we think of the craft of teaching in the college and university. I guess we just need to, I want to recover that vision that, that Lewis had that had a lot more to do with the formation of human beings, you know. Amen. Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. How do you, in light of that, um, and we'll, we'll wrap here soon, but in light of that, how has your own sense of vocation um, sort of come uh, to be formed in these past years. So a lot of what we try to do at George Fox is help students discern their calling, uh, God's calling in their life. And that calling might be a career. It might be, might overlap with their career and some avocation or some other role. We're not thinking about just purely in terms of jobs and work, but to what are you called, Michael Ward? <laughs> um well, I am called to a little bit of academia and a little bit of pastoralia because uh, I'm a Catholic priest as well as an academic. Mm -hmm. And so I help out in a local parish. Um, but I'm also, as you noted, a fellow of one of the Oxford colleges, Blackfriars, and I do online teaching at a Baptist university, Houston Baptist University in Texas. Mm. Um, if anybody wants to study C.S. Lewis with me, uh, they can study the MA program at Houston at HBU. Um, we're always looking for bright new students. Um, not to take anybody away from George Fox, of course. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I, I've always I've always felt that I um, I'm one of those people who needs to ride two horses abreast. Mm. Uh, ever since I was about fourteen, I've sort of known this is my calling. I've got a double calling to scholarship and to the church mm. and um wonderfully i'm able to do it um yeah what about your call to be an actor in uh <laughs> james bond films i see that you're going to be starring as uh lewis's own vicar in the new film that's being made right now the most reluctant convert How, how's your acting life going <laughs> Yeah, that was a beautiful little um, opportunity. So there's this new film, Most Reluctant Convert. It's all about Lewis's conversion, first of all, to theism and then to Christianity. And it stars Max McLean um, as the old C.S. Lewis. And it stars Nicholas Ralph as the young C.S. Lewis. And um, I got to play his vicar. And I, and it was all filmed in the very church that Lewis worshipped at. Indeed, he's buried in the churchyard there here in Oxford. And... Um, it was cool because uh, it precisely embraced both sides of this vocation I was just describing. Because on the one hand, I was able to bring to it all my knowledge of C.S. Lewis as an academic. On the other hand, I was able to wear my own vestments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a priest. Mm. Um, I mean, I was playing an Anglican priest, but I was wearing Catholic vestments. I hope that's, that's not too shocking to people. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was beautiful. It was two whole days of pure fun, some of the best fun I've ever had in my life. And so I really encourage uh, viewers and listeners of this podcast to check out Most Reluctant Convert. It's being released in in America in early November, I believe. And uh, it's pretty good. I've seen I've seen it already, and I, I'm impressed. Mm, it's awesome. And, and yeah, even my little role, my little role is little enough that it's not sufficiently bad to ruin the whole movie. <laughs> Uh, I know you've spent so much time immersed in the abolition of man for your, your wonderful new book and commentary on the abolition of man after humanity uh, released with word on fire Institute uh, press. But if you could step back from that, you've been studying Lewis for a long time. You're like the world's Lewis expert, right? I'll just give you that mantle. You must have it already. Um, what's, what's your favorite Lewis book? That hideous strength. Okay. Which you said um, is the imaginative like sibling of the abolition of man in some ways. 
It is. It's the fictional counterpart to The Abolition of Man. I say the abol- I say that hideous strength, and it is one of my favourites, but I have three favourites, and the other two are The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and Till We Have Faces. Uh, but you ask me for my favourite, and today my favourite is That Hideous Strength. Ask me tomorrow, and it'll be The Dawn Treader. Ask me yesterday, and it'll be That Until We Have Faces. But those are the three that I find most enriching, most satisfying. I, I, I can go back to all three books endlessly, getting more and more out of them. But yeah, that hideous strength is a great counterpart to the abolition of man. And if anybody is struggling with the abolition of man, one way to loosen up for it is to read this fictional fictionalization of the ideas therein. Um, and I have a little bit about that hideous strength in After Humanity too, for, for those who might want it. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael, so much for your time. Michael Ward. Uh, senior fellow, research fellow, Blackfriars, author of After Humanity, joining us on the George Fox podcast. Until next time, we're going to get you back to to Newburgh before long. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye. This has been a production of George Fox Digital. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to the George Fox Talks podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you stream things on your phone or computer. Check us out on the web at georgefox.edu slash talks, where we have videos, publications, and more. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash georgefoxtalks. 